Okay. 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 Johnny Blunt? Here. Jason Hood? Here. Bobby Martin? Here. Lamar Marshall? Here. Mike Williams? Here. Public hearing. Number one. An ordinance for council to declare property donated to the city as surplus property and to donate the Junior Ford North Shore Pool oh. Center for housing. Mm -hmm. Number one, an ordinance to abandon the servitude of the service road next to La Carrera, Inc. at 108 Northwest Railroad Avenue in exchange for all maintenance improvements of public area behind the restaurant. Robert Landry. Good evening. I'm Robert Landry I'm here on behalf of Lock Red Inc. I'll just uh, briefly explain what, what we're proposing and what we're asking for is uh, downtown next to Lock Red, as as you all know, there's an asphalt alley that runs along the side of the building. Um, that asphalt alley, uh, I think, is seldom used for, for traffic. I think when it is used, it's, it's undesirable that, that traffic uh, uses that alley because I think it's a, it's a safety issue. And, and La Coretta is actually the, the record owner of the, of the alley um, adjacent to their, to their property. I think it's 94 feet uh, of the alley. Uh, what we're, La Coretta is proposing is for the city, because the city does not have any uh, servitude of record, but may have acquired implicit rights by spending money, improving the alley, um, resurfacing it over the years. And what we're proposing is that the city abandon that servitude, um, which will allow, will keep traffic from using the alley, but will also allow La Coretta to improve the uh, facade of their building, which I think it's been complained that's an eyesore, perhaps by uh, DDD and, and others, where the dumpster is, can improve all that area and at the same time uh, improve the park, the public area behind the restaurant. And then in exchange for the abandonment of the servitude, those improvements <coughs> to the park and continued maintenance in the future um, of the park behind the, uh, the restaurant. And Lockhart thinks that that'll be That'll be a good deal for the city, but it'll also be mutually beneficial for the restaurant that if that area is improved and it's uh, continually maintained, that that's a benefit to the city and citizens of the city, but also to the restaurant because it's going to improve you know, the look of their property, the value of their property as well. And uh, we think it'll be a benefit uh, for the entire city and the downtown area, the look of the downtown area especially. Robert, does that include a maintenance of the fountain? It, it does, and I think there's there's been some discussions of, um, I, I don't think the fountain is functional right now, but that the desire is there to get the fountain working, improved, and then from there uh, maintain it. I know that's been uh, just an ongoing issue over the years that the fountain's always had problems uh, being kept up. Does that include all the way to the DVD building? It's tracked uh, to A, which I don't think goes all the way to uh, the DDD building. Um, there's uh, a live oak tree there, but there's some other live oaks behind the DDD building, and, and Lockred has agreed to take on the maintenance of the live oak tree directly behind the restaurant. I don't think that includes the other ones. Um, that are next to the DDD <coughs> building. So, so I think the answer is no, that doesn't go all the way to the, the DDD building. It just encompasses uh, the, the live oak and the fountain and not much further than, uh, than the fountain and that, and that brick sidewalk, I believe. Through the brick sidewalk. Through the... That's what we've talked about, including the brick sidewalk. That's correct. So would that impede pedestrian traffic from walking <coughs> through that area? I'm sorry. Would it impede pedestrian traffic from walking through that area altogether? Through the asphalt alley? Yes. Um, I, I think there will be a design, of course, all of this, anything that's done will be subject to the, the approval of the city. 
um, that they will be designed to, to have pedestrian traffic move through there, but um, only on a designated path. I think that's, that's sort of a, a safety issue right now as well, that people can, can kind of walk anywhere there, and um, there's blind spots for cars coming <coughs> through the alley with the building and the patio there as well. So, so the answer is conceptually yes, but of course subject to approval of the city at a later time. So am I misunderstanding that when we do this, would we be, would we be blocking off automobile traffic in that area? So then it would not be automobile traffic anymore, it would just be potential pedestrian traffic. So am I saying that right, Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir, you sure are. And uh, the, the design, when, uh, when uh, Saul came to talk to us about, to Pete and me about this originally, uh, it was designed as an open area, Jane, you may know. Um, so it, it, according to what uh, was discussed with us, there was no plans to enlarge the building itself, to, but to put a pavilion area rather than a building. That's correct, and that's my understanding as well. So then it would not impede pedestrian traffic? No, it wouldn't. I believe that's correct, sir. Okay. Ms. Ms. President, Ms. Terry Lynn, I know that this affects you a little bit. Had, had, has there been something worked out with your office in Salem? As um, far as, I know you utilize it for some parking. Um, can I forward? Yes, ma'am. We've talked about it, and we are good partners with La Coretta, and we are good neighbors. And we've re requested some sort of turnaround system that we can go into the alleyway, go into a, a like a parking lot, a parking space, I should say, and then back up and put our vehicles facing forward because it is a safety issue for us to back up our cars onto Thomas. Mm -hmm. So we have requested that that be considered in the plans, and it seemed like it was a practical thing to do. But then there are other things around that, that we need to talk about because somebody might consider that a parking place, and we would have to put no parking signs. There's always you know, things that you can, can complete when you have a plan. So that, that is basically what we've asked La Coretta to do. How, how about your, your market on Saturdays? Will this affect your market? If it goes just to the, the old fountain, and that fountain has been vandalized. I want to tell you, there's been a lot of money put in that fountain over the years. It's not that it was suffered neglect. I just wanted to make that clear because we went after that for a long time to try to, to fix that. But anyway, I think our market will be fine and if um, Saul um, and he is a, a man of his word, takes care of the maintenance in the back it will always stay nice. We'll respect that. And uh, there may be a time that we outgrow that section. And I think we can be good partners and continue on doing what we normally do if we have that turnaround to keep the staff and some of the folks that come to market so we can get in and out of that alleyway. Uh, Andre, this once we abandon the servitude, it's permanent. It doesn't that abandonment doesn't go away if, if Saul chooses to sell his property. Actually so, I don't Saul may not be the owner, but whoever. Well we've we've included in the agreement that if they default on their obligation to maintain the property, then that abandonment is reversed. And that would include anyone else who may occupy that yes. space. Any input from the audience? Mr. Kudrain, sir. Um, we had had some discussion um, during the week about this particular item and the exact process that we needed to go through. Do you have a recommendation to Yes, I've, I've made a uh, suggestion that because this involves a public street, uh, public rights to that street, that when it comes time for final adoption, we not adopt it tonight, but instead refer to the Planning Commission for their recommendation on what you should do. Uh, and that would be an action you take when it comes back up for final adoption. Thank you. Number two, an ordinance to adopt 
the Unified, Unified Development Code, UDC, and to repeal all ordinances in conflict therewith. PC 2013-5-1, the final recommendation by Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, I know there's several people here to speak about this, so um, I'd like to extend the floor to them if they would like a chance. So. My name is Robert Whittington. I live at 702 Rue Dollar Payne. Uh, this did come to my attention that there was going to be some discussion on this subject. And I read the current, uh, basically a large paragraph regarding what the family is. And then I got the new version today, but then as I understand, it might not be as current as it should be. But it's kind of, uh, looks like ambiguous enough that it would be almost impossible to enforce it. Uh, it talks about the individual of two persons more related by blood, marriage, etc. Then it goes to talk about a group of not more than four, but not all of whom are related by blood and marriage. And then there's a last sentence there that says no more than two persons may be unrelated by blood, marriage, or adoption within a family. So my question would be, uh, I've experienced uh, some of the issues that this ordinance would be addressing. And uh, the bottom line is, how do you enforce this? Who enforces it? Uh, as you know, recently we had a thing, actually February the 10th, that's not too long ago, it made the front page of the paper here. And it said, sword used in non-fatal stabbings. Well, come to find out, they can't identify the guy that actually did the stabbing. And I know the chief's working on this, and uh, there's certain things that they can't talk about at this time. Uh, but I know the woman had 24 staples put in her. I didn't know what those. So my question is, who goes in? And we brought this to the council, not the council, but the uh, zoning attention about 10 years ago because you get a situation where a person has a business and they'll bring in aliens if you will illegal some possibly legal we don't have any way to document it but that should be a branch of somebody within the city government to be able to find out if they're legal or not because they use them for their business and basically all they do is you know sleep and eat there and then they go to work so just my suggestion is that uh, we review this more carefully, uh, try to define it, and if we can't define it, then just don't even try to define it. Leave it alone. If we can't enforce it, we shouldn't have it. That would be my position. Uh, I don't know if I'll get a chance to speak again, but one thing I wanted to say is I wanted to thank the council, particularly Mara Marshall, uh, for getting that flood work done on Rue Lotto Bay. It, you know, it's just, it's wonderful to be able to get up and go get the paper without seeing it floating down the street. So thank you very much. Um, in addressing that, um, he is correct. It's you know, single family. Family is pretty much unenforceable. Um, we found three cases where one in New Jersey, one in California, and one in Baton Rouge, actually, where they said you can't define family. So um, removing single family or family probably wouldn't be a bad idea. So in the case of us going through the process of potentially adopting this tonight and and not trying to prolong, prolong the process any further, because I know we've been back and forth on this, we need to get a, get a recognition from you on how you, what you would do to correct that. Would there be a future amendment that we can address no, at some I, point? We did, we did discuss uh, single family and where it was actually listed in the code in the section, and we removed that altogether. And so... My feelings are, and one of the board members is here, um, that, that this was something that was discussed. And I think it was the intention to remove it, just going to the definition and looking at the definition. Uh, we, we removed the enforcement part of it, just not the definition. So the process will obviously be, as we go forward, yeah. there will be amendments presented that Correct. we'll have to address, as like what Mr. Winton brought up, 
So we'll just have to address that in that, that yes. way. Uh, Andre, I, I would like you to clarify for the record because we've, we've had this discussion many times. We have this probably <coughs> issue in my district as, as much as any other district where folks are renting their home and we have more than two unrelated people living in, in, in the house. And it's been very hard to enforce. People don't understand it because we have the laws on the books, but we don't enforce them. So if we're going to remove those, I want to make sure we're on a record as a statement why, and um, I think it's a, it's a it's a big deal, but it has been hard to enforce. So, it's, or, it's, or even if I can add to that, Councilman Councilman Williams, or, or do we try to find a better way to define the ordinance so that we can do what I think we're intending to do, which is to eliminate uh, 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 people living in homes in an environment where it's not a quote unquote uh, family structure. Yeah. I'll let Andre speak to that, but I think the difficulty it's, is who it's decides harder than what it sounds. It, yes. The difficulty is who decides what's a family. And what, what courts have allowed is for uh, jurisdictions to limit the total number of people mm -hmm. who might be allowed to live in a single family area. Eight people, ten people, six people. The problem with that is if you have a large family with maybe a grandmother, auntie, or somebody living in the house, you may exclude them, even though they are related. So the difficulty is discriminating amongst people who might be either married or related with people who are not married or not related. That's the difficulty. And the Equal Protection Clause basically says you, you cannot make that distinction and define who, define who is a family. Courts of uniform, as Josh pointed out, courts have uniformly struck those down. But what I think you can do is limit the total number. What you run into the danger on total number is if you have a large family, you're excluding that family from living in that area. But then you can also apply. At that point, you can deal with that as an exception versus you, a norm. You could, but once you, once you entertain the variance, then what you're doing is really amending it because you, if you do it for one, I'm not sure you have a good reason if you're just talking about number to do it for someone else. And that's the difficulty with enforcement of these. The law is just striking these things down pretty regularly. And Andre, again, for, for the purpose of the record, you've stated many times, and, and, and we've had some success in, in my district of dealing with the issues that arise out of these potential homes where there are eight, ten people living, and they have, a, they have litter issues, they have parking issues, they have noise issues. So. I just want to go on record saying that's how we we try to focus on those issues. It it would be if the law allowed it a lot better to say you can't have more than two unrelated living in a, in a home. But again, I've had this conversation with Ms. Louise. We've had it ad nauseum over the last seven years, and and you know I, I'm a big proponent. And if you can't enforce the law, why do you have it? It's not always that simple, but. Uh, if we're going to remove it or define it, I'm, I'm all in favor of that. So. Yeah. Louise Bostick, 112 Elm Drive in Hammond. Um, to say that uh, it's, it's difficult to enforce uh, doesn't seem a completely legitimate reason to eliminate uh, a, a rule that maybe occasionally can help if you have integrity on the part of the landowners or the, or the people who own the house. They said, well, it's a rule, and they self-enforce. I, I don't want to place a problem on the police department. It, you know, they can't really do much about it, but are we... Are you saying let's just eliminate the uh, definition of apartment or multifamily uh, housing and just make the whole city <coughs> RA? No, no, that's not at all what I'm saying. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you can't enforce three college kids living in a home, yeah, I we, we have our city employees knocking the door saying it's against the law. Yeah, they shouldn't when in have fact, to it, it, it's being held that it's not against the law. That's why I'm, I'm not changing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to change yeah. the definition of apartment. Yeah. An apartment or a dwelling or a duplex 
I'm just saying we'll still have single family residential yes. Yes. areas. Okay. Yes. Well, see, it sounded like you were saying, "Hey, uh, let's just throw it out. Let's make yeah. the whole town uh, uh, multifamily." Family. And that, that, one house. that doesn't sound. That sounds yeah. like you're throwing out the. I wish we could. Maybe with I the bath water. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. Although I've said this many times, we're a college town, and we have we have the benefits. I we have the benefits, and we have the <laughs> issues that come along with that. And yeah. I wouldn't trade it. Yeah. We have to deal with the with the issues that come along with it. Yeah. And again, we I have I have a house with some college students in it. They are perfect. I love what, them as neighbors. They call me grandma, yeah. and I uh, <laughs> and invite me to their Super Bowl party. No. They're wonderful yes. neighbors. I think the exception is where the problem lies, not the rule. I think because I really hadn't had any issues in a while. So, and I know I know in my district alone there are Absolutely. many cases. So I think it's the exception where we have the issues. Thank you. You answered it. Yeah, okay. I think Ms. Louise had a legitimate concern, and just to ease everybody's mind, we do have defined single-family dwelling okay. as, as well as single-family house, and that's going to remain. So. Okay. Sure. Uh, Ralph Ross, 505 East Robert Street, uh, uh, just a couple of blocks from here. Uh, I'm also a member of the Planning and Zoning Commission. And just to confirm relative to procedure, this was discussed and uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, agreed that we needed because of various court decisions to remove anything that, that actually spoke to uh, enforcement of single family. However, as Josh has pointed out, the definitions are still in there and we still do call certain districts single family uh, districts. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Board has uh, recommended approval to you all of the UDC. Uh, I voted against that, and I'd like to talk to you all for a minute uh, specifically about why. And I've prepared something here that you all can look at as we talk. Uh, basically, the, after Katrina, there was uh, just a boom in residential construction here in Hammond. Uh, the Daily Star reported, in fact, uh, that between December of 2000... Excuse me, you need, you okay. need to be, so you can be on the record on okay. salary. So you can't... You, can you, got, you, got, you got two copies there. Um, this, again, is going back to right after Katrina. Between, uh, as reported in the Daily Star, from December of 2009 until May of 2006, 13 new subdivisions were proposed here in Hammond. All but two of those proposals were almost exclusively 50-foot lots. A number of residents became concerned that these smaller lots being developed in these subdivisions and the taking of, let's say, in a settled neighborhood, a 100-foot lot and splitting it into two 50-foot lots was having an adverse impact on the character of certain neighborhoods. Originating at the Planning and Zoning Commission, there resulted a community-wide discussion between developers and residents on lot sizes and density. Council members stepped forward and formed a volunteer committee consisting of representatives from the Council, Planning and Zoning, the City Planner, the Hammond Home Builders Association, city residents, and the legal community. They came up with a compromise that was agreed was reasonable between uh, allowing builders the freedom to develop and allowing residents to preserve the character of their neighborhoods. That compromise resulted in City Ordinance Number 06, you've got it here, 4078. On September 5th, it was adopted in 2006. Those provisions were then incorporated into the current uh, zoning uh, code, which was revised on June 12th of 2007. In the UDC draft before the council tonight, all of the provisions of that ordinance that were subsequently incorporated into the existing zoning <coughs> ordinance were blown away. They just don't exist anymore. What has happened is, in the UDC, the more affluent districts in the city have actually had side setbacks in uh, increased. The result of increasing the setbacks is that there's more breathing room, less density in the more affluent areas of the city. 
But stepping down the affluence scale, what the UDC does is it crams more and more people together by reducing setbacks, taking away the lot sizes that have been included in that ordinance. And it's not by just a little bit. Um, you have the figures there in terms of the reduction. I'll just point to the last one there. In, in the poorest area of our city, the least, least affluent, they've always had smaller lot sizes and lesser setbacks. So they have the greatest residential density in the city at present. At present. But the UDC makes those areas even denser, and not by just a little. Accessory structure sidebacks, side setbacks are reduced by over 60% from 8 feet down to 3 feet. Now an accessory structure may not sound like much, but if you look at the <coughs> UDC, they can be up to 30 feet tall, two stories high. Three feet apart, most of us in this room right now could conceivably walk into one of these R4 districts spread our arms and touch two foot, two story high buildings with our hands. That's pretty dense. If the proposed UDC is adopted tonight, I would urge the council to do so with the requirement that the existing average lot sizes and building setbacks be preserved. Not go with what the UDC has, but preserve what's in the code right now. For those of you who've got a copy of this, if you've turned it over, you'll see a page from the UDC that shows a picture of an accessory structure. And it's pretty big. So I would ask you all to consider that. Uh, an awful lot of people came together, council members, uh, as I mentioned, the city planner, that whole group, and they thought it was a reasonable compromise then. I don't see any reason to change it now. Thank you. <coughs> I would start by saying that, um, yes, it, it did reduce. Um, that comes from the master plan. Um, and it, it, it does speak about walkable communities, um, denser communities, infill, um, a more urban design. And that's, there's actually detailed pictures that show cul-de-sacs with spread out houses, is, you know, how it's been traditionally done. And then it shows the picture below it where it's very <coughs> dense and houses are closer together. So. Um, to say that you know, all R4 is less affluent, I mean, we have R4s across the board. Um, they're in Forbes Farm. I mean, they're in some of your other subdivisions also. So um, I don't necessarily know that the lot size dictates um, lesser of a dwelling. So um, I would argue that you know, in that time frame of these uh, 13, Thing is what it was uh, <coughs> developments or subdivisions that in that time we had you know, the camellias uh, octavia street and uh, holly gardens none of which i would argue are burdens on the city of hammond so um with that. one more quick question josh if i remember right over probably 18 months or so there were at least three public input meetings where I remember going to two of them, I believe. Was this discussed in there? Just we in every single one of them, we have poster boards that were present in every one of them, and okay. we didn't have any comments on. Them. Okay. So, I have a couple of questions, Josh, <coughs> Mr. President. Um, you know, and I had a chance to to attend the public uh, the the planning and zoning board meeting, and some of the architects were there, and. There was a big discussion about you know lot sizes, and I've I've always kind of initially compared lot sizes to you know the the what can happen when you reduce the lot size and lot sizes into Ralph's point, it allows for maybe you know some different type of development, and um, and so I and I understand the the vision of why we want to have more dense lots in some neighborhoods, and I'm okay with that. But the the, the thing I the thing I want us to be and I'm concerned about is the unintended consequences. So based on what Ralph just said, you know, and I know you made a comment that, well, good things could happen, and I agree with that. But on the contrary, good, bad things might happen, and some developer might come in because of the, the zoning or the codes and do something that could potentially have a permanent adverse effect on the community. 
Uh, in some of the neighborhoods, those things can happen because we have overlay rules, rules that, are, that protect uh, those subdivisions, particularly from those type of things happening, even though we have the new uh, lot sizes. And that's called overlay district, right? Correct. So, and, and in your opinion, why do you think the overlay district works? Because it was a group of citizens who got together and were concerned for their community, and they created and drafted up a set of rules that they would like their community to maybe have over and above what the, the ordinance is called for. And why do you think that benefits the community? Because it preserves what they're interested in. Right. So, and, and, and when we had that discussion at the meeting, the point was that the, the planning, or the, I guess the planning commissioner, I forgot what the, title, what the exact title is, but uh, John Darden, was uh, was a uh, was a uh, very vital to making that happen. So pretty much the city assisted those neighborhoods in developing those overlay districts. Is that what is that? Pretty yeah, much I don't think the city has a problem with helping, but we're not right. going to go initiate it and. Right, I understand. And do that. But, but my my thing is that if it makes sense for us to do that in some neighborhoods, do we think that it makes sense for us to to really look at how we can preserve the same quality of life in the neighborhood like that? Potentially is, in particular, what my main interest. One of my main interests would be the, the Greenville Park neighborhood, and the reason why, even though it's not in my district, I think that's probably one of the uh, uh, has the highest amount of home ownership for African Americans in the city of Hammond, uh, and that's just my unscientific guess. But I would think that that the potential to to that for that area to become the next uh, emerging growth area for Hammond has a high potential for that to happen. You and I have talked about that. So with that said, and I'll be short, with that said, do we think that looking at trying to make sure that as a city we look at those, since they're maybe not particularly in the master plan, but fall in line with the vision of the master plan, that we look at those type of neighborhoods and say, how do we then make sure that those neighbors have a chance to, to be sustainable long term? I would argue that the Greenville subdivision. Um, I actually went and did a count and it was like 170 lots that were 40 foot lots. So I'd argue that actually changing it to all 65 foot lots. And that's not my argument, not okay. to change the 65. So the, the, okay, so your, your argument is the overlays. Do I think they're a good idea? Yes, if the citizens want it. I think if, if the citizens want it, I think it's a great thing. But I think it's something that the citizens have to want and they have to petition for. Josh? Um, and I, I'm by no means an expert on lot sizes and, and urban planning and architecture, but so the master plan was a process that went over and a lot of people in this room were involved in. There was citizen involvement, there were professional there was professional involvement, and what you're telling me is that the UDC follows a master plan. Is that an accurate statement, Mr. Robertson? Yeah, well, well when it comes to the, the infill and stuff, yes, I do think it does. Uh, I'd like to make one last point with that because. I think uh, the UDC has a lot of great stuff in it, and the master plan has a lot of great stuff in it. Uh, Josh referred to a, a pretty picture. The end of, uh, just give them all to me, I just pass it up. In the master plan, and, and basically it does talk about increasing density and walkable neighborhoods. But what it's really proposing is not that you increase density in existing residential districts. You'll notice in this picture it contrasts and it says that the one at the top uh, is less desirable in, in, in light of the master plan than the lower one. But these are mixed use neighborhoods that they're encouraging. Now we have in the UDC and we have in our current code uh, we have mixed-use neighborhoods. We used to call them business and, and that sort of thing. But now in the UDC, we do call them mixed-use. But in the residential areas, uh, the master plan doesn't speak to increasing density there. It also talks, in trying to get this pretty picture at the bottom, uh, about a, a process called TDRs, transferable development rights, and using things like PUDs, where a developer comes in and says, yeah, I want some small lots. I want some garden homes. I want I want variety here, and within there, I want to sprinkle some you know maybe a small grocery store, some things that you can walk to, and as importantly, green space. You'll see in that picture that there are parks 
included in this increased density. But in that residential district, if you put three feet between accessory structures and the property line, you're taking green space away. So just to make sure there's no confusion, I highlighted on that picture that even in the master plan itself, it's talking about mixed use neighborhoods, not the <coughs> residential existing coding, the traditional coding for residential districts. And no, he, he is correct. And the problem is it calls for mixed use throughout the entire city, of which didn't really, you know, I think we can agree that commercial developments in the middle of a lot of our subdivisions for our city would be somewhat undesirable. But there are areas where mixed use works. But it does speak through density uh, throughout. So. I was sort of involved in this from the beginning. And one of the things that we were asked to do in that ordinance that Ralph referred to was demand 10-foot side setbacks. They said uh, eight foot, I mean, what, six foot, five foot existed, six foot's not enough. The compromise was eight feet. And it is a, uh, a matter of walking so much as it was things like runoff from the roof. If your house is within six feet of the next house, you're going to be, you're going to have some neighbor problems. Uh, you don't even want to talk about sleeping at night and hearing your neighbor argue <laughs> 10 feet away. Uh, but that's, that's another thing. But the things such as runoff, you have you have a five foot setback, you have a two foot uh, overhang. Think about rain coming in. Uh, it, there were a lot of issues that we discussed. This did not happen in two weeks or overnight. It, it took a long time and as Ralph pointed out, there were a lot of people involved in, in developing that ordinance. The setbacks is the most painful thing to see disappear from this, from this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. I think water um, we address pretty pretty explicitly day to day. Um, as far as you have to keep your water to yourself, so um, I think we in Nash does a very diligent job of making sure that water stays on the property. So. Are there any further uh, questions? Thank you. I was somewhat in the. What's your name? Address? Webb Anderson. <laughs> Chuck Spang, 603 West Charles. I was in the minority in the 2006 65 foot lot, and I'll explain to you briefly. I'm not trying to argue that over. That's an eight year old argument. Uh, I did not, my, my, my feelings did not prevail. But I will just tell you this one story. When I was first married, the first house I bought was on a 25 foot lot. I can honestly tell you I could not have afforded to build a house if the real estate requirements were significantly greater. And what I argued, and I think Jack was with me at that time, he probably remembers, is that don't forget the people that are just trying to get into a house. If you make these big expansive lots, you're going to pretty much shut out the people that are on the edge they can't quite get a house the other comment is regarding green space the recommendation i made then and i'll make it to you again is if i do think a five foot setback is a real reasonable setback three foot is probably a little tight by the time they put the air conditioner on the side yard and so forth you know maybe five feet more realistic but if you want more green space let's widen our street right away we have seven utilities within our streets we have trees we're having to cut down because we can't get everything in it we're trying to go from four to five foot sidewalks to conform with ADA, and we still have a 60 foot right of way. So green space to me is the curb appeal to the neighborhood, which, which to me a wider street right of way would help, and also a little bit greater setback. So those are my only two comments, or maybe that was three. 
Yes, sir. Let's do the last one. Jack Gotro, 607 North Magnolia, and also with the Tangible Home Builders Association. This one idea has been expressed tonight that the coordination between a smaller lot and a poorer or cheaper house, I don't think necessarily stands. If you go across New Orleans, Baton Rouge, any place across the south or across the country, you'll see today the lots are getting smaller. One is, well, there's a couple of reasons. One is that the lifestyle of people, a lot of people don't want large lots. You know, they, not only just people who are retiring no longer feel like mowing the lawn. Um, other idea is what Chuck was saying is that the price of building today is increasing. Um, and a large part of the price of a house is the price of the land. You know, if we demand these larger lots, you're going to swipe a lot of people off the table to be able to afford a house. Um, you know, today, you, you know, uh, just getting a loan, you know, you're looking at 20% down plus the difference between the appraisal cost and market price. You know, you start increasing lot sizes, increasing the value or cost of a, of a house, and there's a lot of people just aren't going to be able to afford it. You know, and also what Josh had mentioned before is that a lot of these neighborhoods, the redevelopment of them, I think, depends upon making a house economically affordable to most people. If we go in there and mandate an average 65-foot lot size, that's going to be impossible to do. You're just not going to be able to do it. The numbers are just not going to work. So I would urge you all to look at the UDC as it is presented to y'all tonight. A lot of effort went into that. A lot of effort went into determining the lot sizes, the impact it would have upon the neighborhoods, the impact it would have upon the development of the city. And I would urge y'all to pass it as it is. Thank you. Okay, that's going to uh, include our answer to the question. Thank you very much. And now we're going to go into our 6 o'clock agenda, regular session. Roll call. Johnny Blunt. Here. Jason Hood. Here. Bobby Martin. Here. Lamar Marshall. Here. Mike Williams. Here. Okay. Um, we're going to ask uh, Pastor A. Bear to come and play this prayer. Could bow our heads for prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you again for this is the day that you've made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you now, Lord God, for your grace that has been covering our city and our citizens and our leadership. We even pray right now, even that your spirit is present with us in this ceremony or this meeting. We ask now all of these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mr. Dale, it's done. lead us in the I just wanted to send my congratulations to Joe and Miss Peggy. Yeah. Real quickly, I want to recognize Jacob Rester from the Daily Star, who will now be covering uh, the city business. I um, want to invite the council and the public to be here uh, Friday at 12:15 when we melt, when we welcome the King and Queen Omega. <laughs> we'll be toasting them here in the city council chambers. Uh, we have several um, announcements on Keeping Hammond Beautiful. On April the 11th, uh, we're joining 15 other anti-litter organizations across the street to join with us in Leaders Against Litter. Vic, I'm trying to do this in a hurry. Uh, Vic Cuvion is the, uh, the president of Keep Hammond Beautiful. Uh, we do have a couple of cleanup dates. 
Sir? Can you lead us across the state? No, that's too much. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Across, yeah, the state. I'm trying to hurry. Uh, March 15th is a trash bash day. Uh, we'll meet at Clark Park. And then the one after that will be on April 12th. Um, that will tie in with the uh, April 5th community bill that we're going to have at, uh, at, at Jackson Park. Uh, also, the last thing is uh, we got an announcement of an open, open house from Ms. Betty Stewart, who is retiring full-time work anyway uh, from the Tangy Tourist Commission uh, from 4 to 7 uh, at the Tangipaho Parish Convention and Visitors Bureau. When is that? Uh, that's uh, February 25th. Okay. Okay. Are there any new businesses isn't there, in the city? Any new businesses? Okay. All right. We get the approval of minutes. So, second. Johnny Blunt. Aye. Jason Hood. Aye. Bobby Martin. Aye. Lamar Marshall. Aye. Mike Williams. Aye. Motion approved. Okay. Resolutions. None. Old business. None. New business. Number one. A resolution to grant the downtown development district a waiver of the open container law for the art in April event on Friday, April the 4th, 2014, from 6 p.m. until 10 p.m. between West and East Robert Street, West and East Morris Street, South Spruce Street, and Pine Street, with the concentration of visitors on West and East Thomas Streets. Terry Lynn Smith. Once again, we're going to have Art in April. It's the fifth annual. And I can guarantee you it's going to be a beautiful night in downtown Hammond. <laughs> and we'll be all excited to have this, and we're happy to come to you and ask for your approval. We appreciate everything you do for us. So moved. Second. Johnny Blunt. Aye. Jason Hood. Aye. Bobby Martin. Aye. Lamar Marshall. Aye. Mike Williams. Aye. Motion approved. Thank you. Thank you. Number two. A resolution to approve change order number one, final on SSES East US EPA number BR-00F 040501 in the amount of $17,077.30 credit for a final contract <laughs> amount of $145,398.70, project number 616-31202. Chuck. Yes. Items 2 through 4, 2, 3, 4, 5 are all relative to the SSCS. SES stands for Sanitary Sewer Evaluation Survey. It was uh, funded in part by Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation, which is where the USPA, US EPA number came from. Our very capable and productive grants uh, department obtained these grant funds. We actually doubled our survey work. And we based that survey information, uh, the survey information was what is the data that we based our rehab contract, which is underway now. So these projects have been through since December. We've just been kind of working on getting our mapping back because they have a requirement to provide us with maps. We now have all those maps. We're now prepared to recommend acceptance. So the first thing we prior to acceptance is to amend the contract. They're both reductions. How much we can do about it now, they're long gone. We're finished. I would like to use do more, but we're pretty much out of there. So the first one is a change order number one on the SSES East contract in the amount of $17,077.30 credit. I recommend approval of change order one. Second. Johnny Blunt. Aye. Jason Hood. Aye. Bobby Martin. Aye. Lamar Marshall. Aye. Mike Williams. Aye. Motion approved. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Um, Can we read it? Number item three, three is. <laughs> number three. A resolution accepting SSES East US EPA number. BR-00F040501 as substantially complete, commencing 45-day lien period and withholding 10% retainage. Same contract. Now, I rec now that we've amended, I recommend acceptance. Make a motion to approve. Second. Johnny Blunt. Aye. Jason Hood. Aye. Bobby Martin. Aye. Lamar Marshall. Aye. Mike Williams. Aye. Motion approved. 
Number four, a resolution to approve change order number one, final, on SSES-West, US EPA number BR-00F63101, in the amount of $19,517.27 credit for a final contract amount of $156,625.63, project number 616-11304. Similar explanation to number two, this was the final contract amounts. We do have our maps. We are recommending acceptance. And first of all, we recommend approval of change order number one. Make a motion to approve. Second. Johnny Blunt. Aye. Jason Hood. Aye. Bobby Martin. Aye. Lamar Marshall. Aye. Mike Williams. Aye. Motion approved. Okay. Um, number five. five. Number five. <laughs> a resolution accepting SSES West. U.S. EPA. Number BR-00F63101. <coughs> as substantially complete. Commencing 45 day lien period with withholding 10% retainage. Recommend acceptance. <coughs> Motion to approve. Second. Johnny Blunt. Aye. Jason Hood. Aye. Bobby Martin. Aye. Lamar Marshall. Aye. Mike Williams. Aye. Motion approved. Thank you, Chuck. Okay. Number six <coughs> a resolution to authorize the purchase of 42 Dell laptops for the police department using. JAG and LCLE grant funds, state contract number 403834. Total cost is $43,526.28. They see. I tried to make it as short as possible for you to read. Uh, the JAG grant is our federal police grant that we receive, and the LCLE is the Louisiana Commission on Law Enforcement, a state grant that we receive. We have pulled together the two grants to be able to leverage funds to buy the 42 laptops. These are just regular laptops that go in all the patrol vehicles. Motion to approve. Johnny Blunt, Aye. Jason Hood, Aye. Bobby Martin, Aye. Lamar Marshall, Aye. Mike Williams. Aye. Motion approved. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Number seven, a resolution to approve go benches of Baton Rouge to install benches at all 43 bus stops in the city of Hamlin for the purpose of selling advertisement. Carla Smith. Hi, my name is Carla Smith. I live at 12667 East Glen Haven Drive, Baton Rouge. Um, I'm kind of unprepared. I thought this was just going to be introduced today, and I thought we were going to do it on uh, March 4th. But since I'm here, we're going to go through it with it now. <laughs> My, uh, my daughter and I, we have our own business. We build our benches 100% uh, from mixing the concrete all the way through, put it on the street. We are looking to put our beautiful benches that are extremely sturdy um, out on your, uh, on your street so that way your citizens will have a place to sit when they're waiting for the bus to come through. Um, been talking to uh, Mayor Foster and um, a couple of others, letting know exactly how everything is made and how everything is produced. Um, we're going to take the advertisement uh, of the local businesses and put it on the back of the bus benches. We plan on, um, if it passes, to put um, welcome to Hammond to begin with. And then once that spot is sold, then we would put, of course, the local advertisement. Um, this benefits every which way. It benefits the people that are staying there for the buses. It benefits the local businesses. It's a win-win situation all the way around. Uh, we plan on paying the city percentage uh, to allow us to have the benches sit there. We plan on cleaning up the benches. We plan uh, the uh, weed eating trash around it. We're going to keep monitoring them constantly. Um, we can start out with putting Welcome to Hammond on it, or we can also put Keep Hammond Beautiful on it, whatever you guys would like to work with. Um, we can make the graphics on the back as a startup bright, vibrant, very pretty. Our uh, benches are extremely sturdy. They four inch uh, width concrete. They homemade. Everything's homemade from um, the um, the mold all the way to, like I said, put it on a street. Um, I have a local uh, person that's been working with me since 2009 as far as graphics, uh, and our graphics are absolutely beautiful. We do not advertise anything to do with uh, cigarettes or 
a booze or alcohol or any kind of casino, nothing like that. We want everything local businesses and we want everything family accepted. You know. Any questions? I have this one. Yes, sir. Um, by the way, I'm really uh, so excited about these benches. Yes, sir. And with you. Now, the next thing that's going to do is having a cover. Yes, sir. Um, so, if um, some young entrepreneur wants to come in and build a cover over the uh, inches, would that be any well, objections? If you guys have any kind of um, ideas of covers to put on them, or I also have a engineer that's working with our group, and we can have him engineer um, draw up a cover that can go over it also. Oh, so Mr. Pre oh, Mr. President, if I may, if I could jump in there and call on Lacey, we are moving forward with some of that, but I'd rather Lacey tell you about it, if okay. I may. We actually have grant funds that are becoming available to us under our new transportation structure. They're 80% federal funds and 20% match. And in our plan that has already been approved and that is being in in included in the state plan um, is enough funding for five shelters to go forward and then we have actually projected for five shelters each year going forward. And we did talk to Go Benches about it and it will tie, it will connect in directly with their concept. Right. Absolutely. Right. We're willing to work any which way you guys need us to uh, move the benches or uh, change anything about it. If there's anything, any kind of issue someone has an issue about, we are willing 100% to work with everyone. We have no problem. We are easy to get along with. <laughs> very professional, but we like to have a very professional bench, you know, right. top Thank notch. You. Thank you very much. I just have two questions, Mr. President. That's yes. okay with you. And, and two, yes. one, will the will the advertising um, stipulations be a part of the contract? Um, because obviously we will have that. I'm, I'm sure that needs to be documented. And, and I mean, it's, it's great. I, I agree. I believe that we're going to do that, but I think it should be in writing so that we can have that. And also, do we have a, 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 a I guess, an end clause in that contract so that maybe it's an annual renewal, at least so that if things aren't the way we want them to be, that we have a way to exit the, the contract or the resolution? The way the contract is written right now, it's a three year contract. Well, we, well, we haven't seen the contract. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. May I say it? Sorry. Um, the contract um, is. Well, I haven't seen the contract, so maybe I should have, but I didn't see the contract. The contract is a three year contract, and we have a 90 day out to get out either if you guys are not happy with something that's happening um mayor forster has said you know he has a 90 day way out or if something happens with us god forbid somebody pass away my daughter and i something happened to one of us you know what i'm saying i mean illness or something like that if we have to bow out then we you know have a 90 day clause also we will pick up all of our benches um the city will not have to worry about any of that at all mr mayor this one last thing so isn't does the contract stipulate the advertising requirements or do you think that no, should? No, sir, it does not. You, do you? But we, could, we can include it. Okay. Advertising. And if we do that, that's fine. Requirements. Uh, just stipulations, not more. You know, just make it, like you said, no. Limitations. Uh, limitations on what? Yeah. Uh, just to make, we can have that Definitely. in writing on what's well, going I'm a family person, and I don't believe in right. putting anything on there that's going to hurt someone. So, you know. Just, just for free. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank okay. you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Final adoption. I would move that, 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 that we adopt the resolution uh, with the with the requirements that the contract uh, include stipulations on the advertising limitations based on, and giving the mayor the authorization to uh, to uh, review that for us. Second, Johnny. Johnny second. <clears throat> Johnny Blunt. Uh, Jason Hood, Aye. Bobby Mark, Aye. Lamar Marshall, Aye. Mike Williams. Aye. Motion approved with the amendment. Okay. Now we will go into final adoption of ordinance. None. Old business. Number one, final adoption of an ordinance to adopt the Unified Development Code, UDC, and to repeal all ordinances in conflict therewith. <coughs> PC 2013-5-1. The final recommendation by the Planning, Zoning, Commission, and Board of Adjustments is to approve this ordinance. Josh Teller. Um, there were a couple of things I just want to clarify. We need an effective date um, for the UDC. 
Um, I'd like you to specify that in your motion if it so goes that way. And also, just want to clarify the removal of single family and family in the definitions. I, Andre, I'm not sure how it would be appropriate, but I would like to um, change a three foot setback to five foot. And that's for accessory it's accessory, accessory yeah. buildings in the RS three. Yes. Okay. That's the one where it was three foot. That's what okay. I'm asking. And and that and the motion also include did you uh, did you make the motion? No, I did not. No. You may want to vote on them separately. They may be different votes on different items. So okay. um, I'll leave it. Yeah, and I'll, I'll make a motion to change uh, the three foot setback to five foot. <coughs> Josh, uh, and which section, for, Josh? And accessory buildings. Just for accessory second. buildings. It is um, section six point three point one um, in the chart. RS three uh, for side interior. Accessory structure uh, setbacks. It's at three foot or five foot. That's my motion. Motion by William. Second. Johnny Blunt? Aye. Jason Hood? Aye. Bobby Martin? Aye. Lamar Marshall? Aye. Mike Williams? Aye. Motion approved. And what that does is you're just inserting that into the UDC. Okay. Just changing it three to five. Okay. Then, is there another motion? Did you do one? Yeah, did for you recommend the effective they, date. Well, did you recommend that they eliminate the definition of family? And no. single family. Because they're the same exact definition. Okay. So, just so we need to make a motion to uh, a limit to remove to the definition of family and single family. And, family. And, and I would like to add in there, since we're doing that, to keep it from getting too convoluted. Uh, independence, you might need to do it individually. I, I recommend you do it individually. Do it individually? Yes, sir. So I second that motion. So Hood moves and William seconds to remove the definition of family and single family. Johnny Blunt? Aye. Jason Hood? Aye. Bobby Martin? Aye. Lamar Marshall? Aye. Mike Williams? Aye. Motion approved? Okay, so now that's gone. <coughs> now, I want to make a motion to remove the language under authorized private receptacles, remove the language, nor shall any container be allowed to remain for an unreasonable time, either before or after being emptied in the collection area. That's my motion. Is that, sir? That's uh, an appendix, page okay. 810. Is that correct, Josh? I'll have to look. I did not prepare for that. So yeah. 810. Under the definitions. And where are you saying from after street? Nor, nor. Okay. Where it says nor shall. Okay. Second. Johnny Blunt? Aye. Jason Hood? Aye. Bobby Martin? Aye. Lamar Marshall? Aye. Mike Williams? Aye. Motion approved to <coughs> remove the language. Joshua. <laughs> There's the details. I'm okay. sorry. Josh, what effective date would you? Um, I think March 1 would give us a nice clean date to start with. Um, and it's week after next. So. Make a motion to make the UDC effective March 1st, 2014. What you may want to do is if it's a motion to adopt first. it as amended with an effective date point. of March 1st, 2014. I'll make a motion to adopt the UDC as amended. amended, effective March 1st. Johnny Blunt? Aye. Jason Hood? Aye. Bobby Martin? Aye. Lamar Marshall? Aye. Mike Williams? Aye. Motion approved. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. With Josh. the amendment. <coughs> Effective March. New business. Number one. Final adoption of an ordinance to abandon the servitude of the service road next to La Carrera. <coughs> at 108 Northwest Railroad Avenue in exchange for all maintenance improvements of public area behind the restaurant. Robert Landry. Uh, Mr. President, I would, yes. I would ask that, uh, that the council consider referring this to planning and zoning for a recommendation. Please. I'll make a motion to refer to planning and zoning for a recommendation. Johnny Blunt? Aye. Jason Hood? Aye. Bobby Martin? Aye. Lamar Marshall? Aye. Mike Williams? Aye. Motion approved to send this item back to planning and zoning? For their recommendation. For, for their recommendation. Introduction of ordinance and set of public hearing. None. 
And I would like to uh, just mention to the audience that afterwards, after we adjourn, we will go into our Wilbert E. Daniel Field Award of Excellence ceremony, and you are definitely cordially invited to stay and participate. Motion to adjourn. Johnny, one second. Aye. And everybody votes yes. yes.